Всем привет, меня зовут Чак, я работаю с Фритоном, занимаюсь тем, чтобы проектам было удобно пользоваться этой замечательной сетью. А сегодня в программе Митя Грошевский, наш сетево, компания Tone Labs, которая расскажет про white paper нашего проекта. Hi all. Well, first of all, um, the white, the, everything that you're going to hear today is not yet public. So the white paper is not published yet. It's it's still work in progress, but then so it's quite exclusive <laughs> content, I would say, um, because I don't know, like, and I hate non-interactive sessions because, like, I'm speaking to myself a little bit here. So please. Um, you have a possibility to ask questions as far as I understood, uh, please do. And I, I get, like Chuck promised me to send me these questions live so I can kind of stop and, uh, you know, um, do something with that. So Freeton white paper, and I prepared some slides, though I don't like slides. And, um, Uh, the first question like I wanted to ask is what is blockchain and or what are blockchains um, and like why they suck really and I don't know how many of you have developed anything for currently for blockchain like on, on what kind of blockchains but in general I tried <laughs> I tried for several years to develop something. I did, I did project on uh, using Ripple, it was horrible. And then it was before Ethereum actually. And then, and then I tried to do Ethereum projects, several of them. And they all like, they all suck basically just because you can't really develop anything on that. You, you can't use them really as a, as a platform to develop application. And I, I will explain why maybe. Um, so let's talk about Bitcoin first, you know, when we talk about blockchain, like most of the people, when you ask them, what is blockchain, they will, if they know the word, they will say like Bitcoin, right? And Bitcoin, they kind of understand most of them that Bitcoin is kind of a database where the cryptocurrency transactions are stored with basically like, right. They don't really know that there are cryptographic keys involved or anything like that, because most of them are using um, centralized exchanges anyway. So they kind of, well, Bitcoin is something that with a password where I can connect my credit card <laughs> and then, you know, and then whatever. Um, then uh, Ethereum came and most of the people would say if they know Ethereum, and I think that's like from the people that know Bitcoin is like one in hundred maybe, <laughs> or maybe more, <laughs> will know what Ethereum is at all. And um, for them, Ethereum will be like, okay, they will know that it's a, that's a, that's a, it's a smart contract platform. It's a, it's a platform where you can actually do some programming. So like it's a world computer, like Ethereum were, was trying to, you know, sell itself to the world before. And there is, it, it, it's, a, it's a basically a smart contract platform running on top of some distributed database to which cryptocurrency transactions are stored. Now, problem with that is that this computer is really 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 slow it's a one threaded it, it's kind of one threaded computer with um very slow time sharing <laughs> properties and and horrible because of that horrible user experience like i did try to create an application for real usage and very quickly when you do that you If you're not, and it's like if you're not, if your application is not blockchain related, like um, all the time, meaning like it's not DeFi, to be precise, um, then mm, you find yourself very quickly on a private blockchain. <laughs> Basically, like within like a month of the development, you say, okay, this really sucks. I mean, I cannot do that. Like the users will not be able to use it at all. I mean, I, I think it's, you need to pay for every transaction, and then. Um, you need to somehow get the users to hold this money and you cannot really pay for them. It's a really, really horrible experience to pay for something for other smart contracts on Ethereum. And it's like, yeah. So yeah, Ethereum is very big now. It's a, it's a, great, it's a great project because it was the first project which introduces smart contract. 
and um, and for some applications it works. It works for applications like DeFi applications, which based on tokens, which basically um, the transfer of value just in another form. Uh, it, like in, in Bitcoin, you're transferring Bitcoins and in, in Ethereum, you can transfer other things. And that's basically it. Now, when you transfer one thing to another one, uh, you know, this thing from one contract to another contract, then this other contract can do something with that. And it doesn't matter for you that therefore, like how long it takes, like it takes 30 seconds, blah, blah, blah. But there is one small consequence of that is taking like 20 seconds each time. And that consequence in this computer being so you know bad is that it costs a lot to do this, like right? Because if 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 several people want to do it simultaneously, it will be like an old Unix machine, uh, you know, 50 years ago, something like that. more, even more, right? 60 years, 70 years ago, something like I don't know. <laughs> well, um, like from 69, let's say, <laughs> 50 years ago. Um, what Freeton wants to do is to create world operating system on top of a distributed computer that wouldn't suck. And um, we view a blockchain as if you if you view a blockchain as a like computer, right? Then then it's kind of obvious what you have inside the computer, you have a processor level, right? Like the resources, I mean, hardware resource of the computer. Then you have like an operating system which, which manages this resources and brings it, trying to bring it to the users. Then you have like application layer utilities and, and stuff like that, right? So it's a normal operating system stack. When you have an operating system, then developers can kind of start to develop on top of that and, and users use that. Of course, in order for that to be really useful, you need the processor to work somehow faster than a bit in 30 seconds or something, operations in 30 seconds, right? So, oh, as you know, this project is based on TON original Telegram uh, open network architecture. Um, but, so why the Freeton white paper? Because, Freedom actually is building on top of what Nikolai Durov created, which I view as a processor. So if, if say, um, if we consider Ton as a processor, then what we built is operating system on top of that. Now, of course, while building that, you, when, you, when you take that view, and you build an operating system and you want to bring it to the user and you start to build all sorts of tools, which I will explain what they are, you kind of quickly realize that maybe there is a problem with, with this processor, right? And, and then you start to change it to, to fit. And this white paper is talking only and exclusively about things that we changed, meaning the architecture that we have built. So nothing here is related to, um, you know, ton and ton white paper by Nikolai Durov, but of course it's an architecture which built on top of the kind of network processor that um, he created. So like this is the stack more or less. So we talk about multi-threaded uh, sharded, which in processor would be like multi-core, I think the most like the, the, the closest analogy um, processor, you know, because it's a network operating system and it's a network processor. So you have not only like processing units, but you have to organize this processing unit and you organize it by uh, network protocols. So when we talk about processor, network processor, we talk about protocols and some computing engines on top of that. And on top of that, you have like developer tools and some architecture for, um, let's say, um, programming on top of that machine or network, um, which, which is very unique. And um, I will talk about that briefly also. And then you have, you have user interface. And user interface, it's, it's also tricky. Um, and we call it browser. And you know, we'll 
we'll we'll talk about that. So first of all, let's let's talk about briefly about this virtual network processor. So first of all, you have consensus protocols, and you have the processing architecture. Basically, like um, the the things that you want to get from this processor when when you uh, you compute something and you want that to be written into the log of 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 this kind of processor operations um you want it to be written in in such a way that it will be very fast meaning that you will reach the finality which would, what we call in blockchain right With the operations that are not reversible let's let's call them final so you want fast finality you want large throughput because there are a lot of concurrent users concurrent computations that you want to do right and you want security obviously like these are three major i think um you know things we want to get from that so let's talk first of all about multi-core multi-threading um thing that that freeton is is building um, if you think about, so you, you have two types of, I largely two types of views on the, on the, on the, how you can do processing, right? You can do single thread and multi-thread and really, um, we are competing right now, I think, well, with more or less three, I think blockchains altogether for, for the, for the fast finality throughput and security. And one of them is Solana. And another is near, probably in third is, is, is us maybe. And, um, but I want, I don't want to talk about near because they are like, they're, it was a sharded architecture like we are, but not exactly. But Solana is like an opposite scales because Solana is saying, okay, let's say one thread, um, and make it really fast. Well, of course, like you know what happened to one-threaded computer architectures? Well, they, they mostly died. Um, and they died because simply because like there is a limit to what they can do in terms of uh, uh, scalability. So uh, so if you view how Freeton works, basically you, sh well, in sharding is, mm, is a word that, that use the, that we're using too much in blockchain space, and I don't think it's correct. And and uh, and I think Nikolai Dorov uh, didn't use the uh, well precisely sharding. Maybe he intended to do something else. But anyway, in the end, like what 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 has happened is that we have multi sharded, multi threaded uh, processor, network processor, meaning that in you in order to shard, you need to shard the data. Right, so you shard the data and you call it sharding, but then inside um, this data, you still want to uh, parallelize processing of the of the programs that you run. So you call it well parallelized processing, like you call it multi-threading. So when we have shards, it's called work chains. Each work chain has the its own set of data. And that's a little bit like parachains in, in Polkadot, though in par parachains are a little, like the much more independent, which, which, is, um, which is a problem uh, for security guarantees. But anyway, um, so we have them, this work chains, um, let's think of them as a, as, a, as a course, and then, or the processor course. So they have their own, their own own data. They can operate with their own memory and their own like uh, uh, hard disks and stuff like that. And then we have inside each uh, each of work chains, we have a parallel execution of smart contracts by uh, subsets of validators. So subsets of machines which are chosen for for that particular task. Uh, and these machines are rotating uh, dynamically, like they dynamically multiplying themselves. So if you need more threads, it's just the, the system will just you know scale until certain point. Um, but the data will be the same, and that is that is an important characteristic. Uh, nobody's doing that this way. That allows us to do a lot of things, and one of the things that allows us to do it allows us to um, 
optimize the BFT consensus. Like the, the consensus we were running, like the consensus that Nikolai proposed is, 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 a, is a BFT based consensus. It's a, a cl close to tender mint implementation actually with some modifications that Nikolai did. Now, um, there, is, there is some problems with this uh, like naive approach of a, let's say BFT. Okay, we put the BFT consensus into the into the work chain, and then we put the BFT consensus into the master chain, which is the the chain which is basically like um, connects all the all the work chains uh, together. You can think of that as a as a as a bus between cores, right? In the in the processor, I think think that way maybe. Um, so and you you do, you do BFT there, and BFT consensus is quite fast, but still. You have like two, three seconds for consensus in, in the uh, shard. And then you have um, four or five seconds consensus in, in, in the master chain, which means you will not see your transaction finalized in like five, uh, 10 seconds, more or less, because like taking time in the, all the sending and so on, like messaging exchange, uh, which, which is a problem. Like 10 seconds finality is a problem. And mm, well, you think for first thing you think is like, okay, Solana, because probably it's it's a single chain, like single thread uh, in our terms, like they can do faster. Well, um, they don't, they can't. Uh, what they show as a finality, subsecond finality, it's not really finality. It's a, it's a probabilistic finality of something that you say, okay, this guy, mm, collator which, which collates the block okay he he is putting some some stake and if he's doing something wrong after you know whatever is built on top of that like two three four other validator cycles um he will get slashed well here's the problem with this approach um imagine a smart contract that has um has some some money in it like, um, I don't know, some millions in it. Uh, let's say 100 million. And imagine um, a bridge to another network, say, you know, Ethereum network. And imagine you are a collator. So you, you just uh, basically write a transaction which, which sends all this $100 million which don't belong to you. You don't, you don't, you know, you don't care. You just create this message, you create this transaction, and uh, and it sends to the bridge, and the bridge is executed in the same block, and it goes to the Ethereum bridge on the Ethereum side. All right. So of course you can say, well, the relayers or whoever is sending that, they can wait for like this amount of time to be sure that the you know the, the security guarantees are increased. Well. <laughs> Where, when, where is your subsecond <laughs> finality in this case, right? So there is none. And if you won't wait, you'll say, okay, with subsecond finality, then you know he, the, the validator which will be slashed, but for much less money than 100 million. So when we say finality, the finality need, be, need to be backed by a lot of money, right? Um, so the validator, and not only that, it, it needs to have a prob very low probability of success, success, right? So we changed the protocol um, to, and we call it soft majority voting consensus. Soft majority voting consensus allows us in a, in a thread to reduce actually the number of required signatures um, of the normal BFT consensus from like you can go to as low as 10%, for example, while increasing the security um, by including random uh, sampling of the validators from the whole work, work chain to uh, validate uh, deterministically random blocks, meaning that, uh, that the collator which collates the block doesn't know who will be validating their blocks in the end. We can do that because inside the work chain, everyone has the same data, so it's quite fast. We also have, I won't go into the details of how this protocol is done, but we are proving that everyone have the data. So the data is available to all the validators. And then we're proving that particular validators is chosen 
um, or set of validators is chosen to validate that block on top of the 10% signatures that have been done in the, in the, inside the thread. And that changes every time with every block. That actually provides better guarantees than 66% uh, of the shard uh, validator signatures. It, um, mm, because you can, because the collator doesn't know, then you can actually like multiply the probability, um, which, which brings us to the levels where the collator is no longer in the position to um, like rationally um, bet that the, the malicious validator will, will, will also, um, you know, check his block. So, so this is the this is first thing we did. So that allows us to um, reduce the, reduce the uh, amount of time, the finality uh, for that. We don't even need to wait actually for master chain to collate the block. So we don't need to wait uh, additional like five seconds for the, for the validator. Okay, let me see the questions. Uh, okay, that, that, uh, let, let me answer this question about the, the tokens in the, in the end of the presentation because I have some, some economic slide. All right. Then there is one more thing. Mm. The operation, the, the question is, is your operating system for end users or for scientists? Uh, or like AWS Azure Cloud. Yeah, it's like AWS Cloud. It's it's for developers and users. Like that, developers can can you know easily easily develop applications on top of that, and and users can can do. Um, every operation operation system we can view MS DOS, Linux, so on. Look like common prompt. Windows, rigid issues. Yeah, can you describe user interface level? Yeah, I will describe user interface level for sure. So um, then there is another addition to the, to, the, to the protocol stack, which called the Reliable External Message Protocol, or REMP. And that protocol enables us to, um, like right now in the, in the original proposed tone, external messages that has been sent from user to a smart contracts are not guaranteed of delivery. And because of that, we have a lot of problems. First of all, like it, it slows down significantly the user experience first thing. The second thing, it also um, enables the replay attack. So like you need to have a, a replay protection inside the smart contract to, to mitigate for this kind of attack because of course external messages coming without value. So like they can send as many of them as, as, as they want. And we have created this RAM protocol and RAM protocol, um, it's a, it's a guaranteed, um, guaranteed external message processing protocol. So they, when, when the message sent from the user to the validator set of the particular thread, the validator is sending back receipt of that. And if, 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 if the user has received the receipt, then it means that um, their a transaction will be included in the block and it will be included in the block in a certain order. Now, remember one thing also that in uh, comparison with Ethereum, for example, uh, well, or most of other blockchains, like the order of the transactions are, depends on the will of the validator, the collator in this case, um, or miner. In the, in the case of Freeton, it's determined. So the the, the the validators cannot change the order. They not compete for transactions. They cannot change the order of, of transactions in most of the cases. The only case where they can, it's with these external messages and only when they kind of collate them. But they only can do that for the particular slot. And once they committed to this, once they send the receipt, they can no longer change the message. It means that there is literally, like it's very hard to do front running, if not impossible entirely. And the replay protection of this protocol is built in. So that's another addition. Then uh, maybe I'll skip because it will like go really technical down the line, but there are many protocols like dynamic validator set protocol, dynamic slashing protocol, which allows us to dynamically slash validators once, once they, you know, they're not performing well because we have a high performance 
processor, if the validator is not performing well, we, we kind of, we cannot um, allow him to continue to validate. So it will, he will be like, um, like replaced and stuff like that. So um, all of these protocols, by the way, not all of them are implemented yet, like in the fully, but, uh, but that's the design. And uh, none of these protocols has been in the, you know, in the current. So we had to change that to allow the architecture that we want from the user perspective. Of course, the other part of the virtual processor is, is the execution engine, engine, which is the, you know, based on Ton virtual machine and Ton virtual machine, just in brief, it's a, it's a very compact virtual machine, which, um, Mm, which compacts data very well into the three structures. Um, it's of course Turing complete and it's extendable. And then you have like a storage layer and you have on top of that, uh, the, the languages and compilers. And that's important, I think, for developers. When we talk about languages, of course, uh, like you have assembler, like in normal computers, but I don't think that the normal computers will su would succeed and the operating system would succeed without, you know, the modern uh, languages and the compilers to support them. So Freeton supports currently Solidity and C++ slash C uh, on LLVM framework compilers. So you can, if you ever wrote a contract for, for, for the Ethereum for Solidity, you can easily kind of, uh, do that. It's not exactly the same, meaning that um, because, because this is a asynchronous platform, so there are no synchron synchronized operations uh, like in Ethereum. And uh, I, I think you can understand why, because we have a multi-threading and we have sharding. So you can't really do synchronous operations on the sharded. Uh, blockchains and Ethereum, when they will, if I would say they will ever do finally <laughs> implement their sharding, um, they will have they will, they will have to do the same work that we already did um, with with Solidity compiler to to uh, you know to allow asynchronous operations. Another Im very important aspect, which never been um, discussed. Um, in the context of um, TON is something that we call distributed programming. Mm. And we take a very different, I think, view on how the, the programs or the smart contracts need to be written for, the, for this blockchain. Um, let's, I don't know how many developers are actually listening, but I, I think everyone should be a developer, <laughs> I hope. Um, so usually when you develop today for Ethereum, and again, if you ever did that, how you develop for Ethereum? Well, you create a smart contract and you create a hash map. That's how you do that. Like it's uh, say ERC20, it's a ledger. It's a ledger which, uh, which you put inside the ledger. <laughs> right, so, so if, you, if you think it, Ethereum is a ledger, right? Um, then every smart, let's say ERC20 token. What is ERC20 token? It's a hash map, right? Of the key, you know, value, and you put it into that, uh, into that, and it can become very big, this hash map. It's a really horrible design. Like you don't, if you think of, okay, say you're developing for a database, all right? You don't expect to put inside the database cell another database. Like you, you, you don't really do that that much. It wouldn't be, well, they do sometimes, right? But it wouldn't be very elegant, I would say, design. Like right? JSON. Well, exactly. But no, but JSON is unstructured data. You're not really supposed to iterate on that inside the database operations, right? So you wouldn't like, I don't think it's a, it's a valid comparison. So, and it's not a JSON that they put there. It's a real like table. <laughs> It's a key value. Um, so uh, we believe that it's a, it's a horrible, um, horrible design choice. You, you don't do that. So what can, what can you do? Like how sh should we do it otherwise? Well, let's imagine 
we have a whole blockchain as a key value store. Let's think of a blockchain as a key value store. Don't talk about like transactions, whatever, just key value store. And then we can, can execute some operations on chain, meaning on inside this database on top of this key value, right? That would be called functions, I think, the closest in database design, right? Or functions are, are programs that database itself can, can run. It's very close to that. Let, let's stick to that. It's nice. I like that. So um, let's imagine that our whole blockchain, the whole free tone blockchain is a one huge key value store, which can also run some programs like functions on top of this key values. In this case, the programming would be a little different, don't you think? Like think about the ERC20 token, okay? Um, you wouldn't do, you, you would put a separate object. It can actually be like the closest, maybe if you, if you, if you look at that as, as a programmer, maybe like think of object-oriented programming. Um, you put an object, which is a key value, which is like your user key and the value of tokens, right? And this cell that you put it in has an address, right? And then you can stick some code on top of that, like a function, right? And then let's say we want to transfer this token from one user to another in this table, like in this queue, in, the, in this database. Well, we send some, and remember that this is asynchronous, right? So it's a network computer, it's asynchronous operations. So let's say that this, um, this cell will, um, call another cell, let's send a message to another cell and say, okay, um, I have 10 tokens, let me give you five and reduce the, the balance by five and, you know, and send this message and the other cell will just increase the balance by five. All right, end of story. That's it. <laughs> well, there are some caveats, like you cannot do that in Ethereum right now. <laughs> Uh, well, because the Ethereum is not designed that way, mm, but we can. So you need some security guarantees. You need to be able to, um, you need to be sure that the cell that is sending you a message is really has the code that, um, that, that you trust, meaning that you know that this code, when it's executed, will really deduct the balance by five. If you know that, right, you can trust that cell and you can increase your balance by five. And this first cell also need to know that it sends the token to, you know, someone which has the same code. How can we do that? Well, thanks to the design of Freeton, um, the every address in Freeton is actually, a cal you know, you calculate the address uh, from some data and um, and a code, and a hash of a code, which means that the the address itself contains the code. And in Freeton, there are no addresses, active addresses, something that that act addresses that can actually send you a message that do not contain the code. It's in this respect, it's an ultimate smart contract platform. It's like an ultimate computer. So. Um, it's called TIP3, and this is the only distributed token with atomic structure exists because of the uniqueness of the architecture that we have. So TIP3 token is basically just a contract on a, on a user account with a balance. And um, in these contracts are, you can deploy as many of them as you want, of course. And you know, of course you, you like change the code and when one of these uh, cells, one, one of these contracts sen sends the tokens to another, sends a message to another with the tokens, this other contract can actually verify that the code that is sending these tokens to him is actually the same code that he's running. And because this code does not have, uh, it's, not a, it's, it's like immutable, it doesn't have a set code operation within, well, we know that because we know this is the code. <laughs> Uh, then that's it. We can operate on this data set. And I think this is brilliant, 
right now, of course, it's just one example. Another example, like I can give you another example of like decentralized name service. We actually have implemented, it's called Benz, decentralized name service. And the difference with, again, with Ethereum uh, decentralized uh, name service is that in Ethereum, it's a huge hash map. What's the problem with a huge hash map? It's not only that it, uh, it's not scalable. It's not only the problem that the iteration over this table can take like a lot of time and resources. It can be very expensive. But it's also, you actually need to go to that call, that smart contract, to receive the data from the smart contract, to actually understand you know, where to go because the addresses are really written there. Um, uh, what we have done with Dance, I think it's the, first of all, it's the fastest DNS service ever. Like it's, it's faster than any DNS, even the normal DNS that we use today. And how it is done? Well, think of that, of the code um, that you put in the, in the address part, uh, say as a certificate. Like the code is a certificate. And then you need to resolve a name, right? Say you download this certificate once, like you download your certificates in the browser. So you download the dense certificate, which would be a smart contract code. And then you want to resolve the name. So you just put the name that you want to resolve, put a code to it, hash it, and you get the address. That's it. You don't even need to call the blockchain, don't even need to read any data. It's just, boom, you have it. You should really, um, you should really try it because it's a magic. <laughs> but you can do this stuff in Freeton. It's, it's really, and you can imagine many of these use cases, um, which, are, which are really, I think, brilliant. If you start thinking this way, you, you will quickly arrive to, well, this is an example of, this is Dense. Dense also has, apart from, from the resolving part itself, it has also the auction. Um, and we wouldn't be we if we would create an auction as a hash map. So of course the auction is done via distributed programming paradigm. And in distributed programming paradigm, there is no single contract that is holding the auction. Every bid has its own contract. And the auction itself is actually a very small hash map, like in two, three, because it's a second, it's a Vickery uh, second price uh, uh, auction. So it, it actually need to hold two. <laughs> So it holds two because it needs second price, right? So there's a hash map of two, two, uh, two entries. That's it. All the rest of the auction is running over the whole blockchain. Meaning the, if you want to, to bid for the auction, you just take the contract code that you need and you deploy that contract on the network and, here is your, and put some money into that and here's your bid. And this contract will execute everything else. It will send a message to the auction like when that it's needed, it's, it's a whole scheme. It's, it's even it's even not in the whole, I, because it's a re, only, re, I stopped by reveal phase. There is also a finalized phase there. But anyway, it's just an example. So it's a, it's a totally distributed, completely distributed. It's a really database kind of programming. And it's very elegant. This is the NFT example. Again, usually on Ethereum, <laughs> You would do a huge hash map of your NFTs. On Freeton, each, each NFT is a small key value, basically. It's a small with a code, a, a small entry to the database for each NFT. But because it has this parts of the address, which, are, which you can calculate from the, from the code and the data, you can then play with that and the things that you can do is actually you, create, you can create indexes. So say the collection on a NFT collection is, has a code of the NFT collection. And this code is unique. And we can prove, and there are special techniques for that in Freeton, uh, in virtual machine including, um, we can prove that this code is only deployed, could only be deployed by this collection meaning root contract. The root contract doesn't have any, any collection inside itself. It doesn't have any hash map. It basically just deploy the contracts when it needed from the code that it has inside. And we know 
that this code can only be deployed by, the, by this route, which means now if you search the blockchain by hash of the contract, you will get immediately the whole NFT set as a table. And the hash of the, this first part, the red one, is a, is a data. So you can put there text, pictures, some data. You can add metadata to that, and, uh, and you can search by that as well. So you can search by the whole thing. You can search by two things. You can resolve, actually, also the address by as as we do in with dance. So by taking the the like the data itself, if you know the data, you know the picture, you can you can calculate the address where this picture would be in the NFT collection. And again, for that you don't need to do anything. So, yeah. To the question of the user interface, and that will be the last part, I think. So we didn't stop here. Uh, <laughs> we said, well, not only blockchain sucks, but Web3 also sucks. And Web3 suck because it has centralized layer. And what's the point on creating a decentralized censorship resistant blockchain if you call this blockchain through the user calls this blockchain through some interface that sits in the web. Like it defeats the whole purpose. Like why do we, <laughs> if we already have this um, completely like insecure layer in between, then, you know, what's the point of having them in the blockchain in the first place? Let's put them in the database already. So, and of, I won't go there, but I, I think that the whole notion of, okay, let's create another layer is kind of a bad architecture and the user experience is horrible. Think of that like, okay, I need Ethereum blockchain for my security tokens, blah, 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 but it doesn't work very fast. So I'll add another layer like layer two, which works fast, but doesn't have the security guarantees. Oh, now I will need to bring it to the user, which I need a web three, but instead of, but because I don't want centralization there, I will put another layer, which is uh, whatever storage layer where I put the, so th that's layer number three. So think of the user experience of going through all these layers. I mean, it, it, it's just, so to exit the website, I will need a week. Like I do in optimistic rollups. I mean, come on, <laughs> it's absurd. <laughs> Let's, it, it, you, you don't build, you know, modern IT stack like that. So we said, we need to rethink that it doesn't work. And what we did, we created something called DBots. And it's coming from end-to-end -end decentralization uh, concept that, that we, we have introduced. And it's really, it's a homologous structure, meaning that it's just one thing, okay? It's all one thing. And Dbot is actually a smart contract, but instead of running on the blockchain itself, this smart contract runs on the user machine. Uh, but it's written the same Solidity language with some, of course, you like, yeah, you need to like you need to call interfaces, call interfaces. But well, interfaces is something that browser do. Like you, you have it in the HTML today, right? So web free browser. We call this, by the way, whole thing we call web free, <laughs> and um, which is nice name, I think. And uh, so you have web free browser, and web free browser is something that no knows how to you know interact with Dbot through these interfaces. And I will show you how it looks. It looks like this. Um, this is this is a debot on the left left side is debot was staking debot and uh, it 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 runs like a, like a, in chatbot but actually you can do it as a web page it doesn't matter really um, so yeah it talks to you <laughs> it, it talks to you and it's really easy and you can you know and on the on the right side you see the multi signature. Uh, smart contract, and uh, you can just hit some buttons, and uh, and you and it is completely secure. There is no web layer, nothing, no internet, completely web free. You actually just download this from the blockchain directly. You can verify it by proving that this data has been downloaded from real blockchain, and then you send it back as a message to the blockchain when you're done. That's it. End of story. And the whole user exp in, in interface and user experience is just you know, drawn to you by the browser. And uh, you can write that browser by yourself. Yeah, <laughs> we'll go to you. So, um, well, just two, I think, important uh, topics to just very briefly. 
that of course it doesn't stop in a technical layer because because we have a blockchain and the blockchain is a social construct first and foremost and so we need some governance on top of that and there are some things that we're doing in the gov governance uh, which i think very important again the voting through the smv there is a whole pbft governance protocol for distributing the tokens in a meritocratic way because what freeton is doing is we are well you can buy the token of course but we're also distributing tokens by uh, contest and that's called meritocratic token distribution it's actually part of the economy part anyway part of two two part <laughs> Um, so you can you can uh, like go to Freeton, you can participate in contests, you can win some tokens. The contests are technical or not technical contests. There are juries, and the juries are falling right now. They are kind of manually, but they the the contracts are underway right now under development, which will do it completely automatically. And this yeah, um, it's like Byzantine Font Tolerant Governance Protocol we call it, which governs all that. And yeah, well, economy is Tom Crystal basic currency, the validator incentives and, and slashing. And uh, we're, we're uh, going to change the way, that's something from the white paper that no, no, no one heard <laughs> until now, is that we actually stop, we will stop um, the emission of tokens. Right now it's emitting tokens, new tokens for new blocks validator uh, validators validate create so um we will stop that and the tokens will go from the reserves that we have um so we, we won't create any more tokens and the reason for that i won't touch now because we're running out of time um but uh, there is a work i did with andre lashen which called ton not a ton binary system and that work describes the reason why actually so you can you can read it it's uh, something to do with store of value versus stable coin kind of thinking thank you for your attention do, do we have a questions i sent you some questions oh okay 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 so let me go that's interesting let me go for it. Uh -huh. So I think that they did that all. Oh, okay, so Freeton cannot distribute tons to U.S. citizens. That's that's already passed. That that was that was before the decentralization happened. Now they they were you know we're a decentralized system, decentralized blockchain. So there is no limit. This limit does not apply anymore. We, we can we can do whatever we want. Um, okay, so I think I I I just I talk I spoke about interfaces. I think this. Which language is more preferable for smart constraint on? Okay, uh, um, so you have Solidity and it's totally fine. You have C++, C++ and it's totally fine. Both of them, it's just appealing to different users. So whatever is more comfortable for you, uh, you can use. There is also will be a new language that will be introduced. Uh, by it, It's done by uh, Provenda team. Mm, and uh, this is actually language on top of Solidity. And this language will allow a formal, formal verification much faster. So it's, it's kind of secure, uh, it's a secure add-on. It's written in Coq, but, uh, but it's, it has its own language. It's of course like you need to, it, it, but it's not that hard. Um, it, it, you can do that. Like it's, it's not uh, horribly hard like Coq, uh, but it will compile to Solidity. So you will understand what it's like the, the, the thing that it's compiled to. It. Yeah, uh, guys, the organizers are telling me that we're running out of time. And you can send all the questions, and we will answer them later. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs>